Just how does the brain of a real psychopath work? Could we be hiding a dark side ourselves? My next guest found to his surprise that his own brain matched brain scans of known psychopaths, and he has not murdered anyone as far as we know. James Fallon is professor of psychiatry and human behavior at the University of California, Irvine, author of the new book, The Psychopath Inside, A Neuroscientist's Personal Journey into the Dark Side of the Brain. Welcome to Science Friday. Thanks for having me, Ira. That uh, soundtrack gave me all warm fuzzies, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how accurate are the Dexters and the others and the other psychopaths that we've seen from Hollywood? Well, most are conglomerate characterizations of really a mix of ca real characters, but it's also a mix of different syndromes. Usually what is portrayed as a psychopath is somebody that may have antisocial personality disorder, the criminal side of psychopathy, uh, but also maybe malignant narcissism and sadism. So there's a, usually a mix, and, and it's really not the most, really not the common psychopath that uh, that's on the bus with you or in your office. But you think that there are common psychopaths walking amongst us? Oh yeah. Give uh, how sure. how many? How do we know them? Well, for the the people who are, you know, go over the line, that is, they're, they're really called clinically psychopaths, there's about 1% to 2%, about 2% of men, about 1% of women in most societies. Uh, once you go to the borderline people, the people who don't quite get over the test scoring for a full-blown psychopath, then you start to get up to 5, 10, 15% of the population who may be near psychopaths or pro-social psychopaths that can navigate their way very well through society without ever being caught. What is the, what is the definition, then, of a, of a psychopath? Well, the, one of the problems is there is no accepted definition. You know, the, the, the DSM-5, you know, that psychiatrists and psychologists use, it doesn't even recognize it as, as, a, as a syndrome. Uh, and that's true for a number of these personality disorders. If they're not accepted by everybody because... Mm -hmm for several reasons. Some is that, that the, the traits of, let's say, a psychopath overlap with the traits of somebody with the uh, malignant narcissism or overlaps with somebody with these other, uh, some other disorders. So it's not a clean description. And, and so the uh, physicians tend to reject it, even though it's used very, you know, in forensics and yeah. law and regular conversation. Uh, but in general, well, how would you characterize somebody? Well, the key things, I, I wouldn't include the criminality part of this, uh, or, you know, the, you know, the fire-breathing, angry sort of uh, you know, psychopath that's portrayed that's so interesting in a two-hour film. It's more of somebody who really doesn't care about the other, the other person. And they will, almost all their actions are directed toward pleasing themselves. And so they don't have, they may perceive, uh, what may be the other person, but they end up acting like they don't care at all. So they kind of look right through you, but they use you, and, and they will manipulate you uh, either to play a game or to get money out of you or to get sex or whatever. So they're very manipulative, and they don't show this sort of manipulation because they're quite clever mm -hmm. about it. So they know how to model uh, or mirror behaviors very well. They can look like they're normal. That's, that's what's so insidious about it. Uh, James Fallon, author of the new book, The Psychopath Inside, and of course, the most fascinating part of this book to me is your discovery that you match the brain scans of other psychopaths, and you, you, your discovery that you might be one. Yeah, Ira, that was pretty wild. You know, it was, uh, I had started studying PET scans and some other scans of killers, serial killers, psychopathic killers, impulsive killers from about the early to mid-90s on. It was not my main area of study, but as a neuroanatomist, I'm able to read patterns of these scans, which I do for many syndromes. And uh, that was going along one or two a year from different laboratories, and then I was given a large bolus of scans uh, in the mid-2000s. And when I looked at it, after a couple of months, I realized that there was an underlying pattern. And, and I, I didn't know who was who. Some were normal, some were had schizophrenia, et cetera. But they clearly jumped out at me. So there was this common underlying pattern of low brain activity in the emotional brain, the limbic system of these, uh, of these killers and psychopaths. And so having that, about the same time we'd 
done a, uh, we were doing a study in Alzheimer's disease to, disease to discover genes for, uh, for, for Alzheimer's. And I put my family into it because my wife's family, their parents died of Alzheimer's. She had a lot of family members with it. But she's normal, right? And so I said, look, why don't we put all of us, like we get my brothers involved, we get you know, some of our kids, and we'll see if we're okay. And so as part of that, it had nothing to do with psychopathy, but as part of that, I, um, you know, we did the PET scans, and it came back, and there was one. They were all normal except for one. And I thought, it, it, I said, you've got to check this because it looks just like the scans that, it, that I had of all the kind of the worst killers I had looked at, and they checked several times in the machine and everything, and the technician said, no, it's for real. And when I uh, pulled back the code, uh, it was me. Um, so I looked at that, and I kind of chuckled, and I said, well, you know, it, you, you, what, what do you say to yourself? Well, I first said to myself, have I killed anybody? You know, what, uh, because I, uh, I had kn- I'd known the pattern, or am I just wrong about the, you know, this, this idea? Well, over the ensuing time period, I had our, all of our genetics tested. And again, well, my family, they had a nice balance of high aggression, low aggression, high and low empathy genetics. Mine was pushed all the way, almost all the alleles we looked at for high aggressiveness, low empathy, low interpersonal empathy, and all the things that we think of genetically as being associated with a psychopath. So that was two, uh, there were two things, the genetics and the brain pattern. And then, then it started to go downhill after that. Wow. So, so why are you not a killer? What, what pushes some psychopaths or people who are like them, like yourself, over the edge? Well, in a way, you might think of me as a born potential psychopath because I have all the brain and genetics a prime for that. When I started looking at this, Ira, I realized that compared to everybody I knew, I had this incredibly wonderful, nurturing uh, growing up period, you know, from the time I was born, I looked, looked at all the movies and pictures, and I, I was always with my family and friends, I was a happy kid, and I was kept happy, and, you know, part of that may have been through serendipity, because, or, be, or for a real reason, uh, part of it is maybe because after my older brother was born, my mother had four miscarriages, and then I was born, I was like the golden child, just because I was born, I didn't die, you know? Yeah. And then I was followed by several other miscarriages, so I'm in the middle, in a larger family, of 10 years of no kids. And I think I was treated special at first because of that, so I was carried everywhere and just loved. And, and then uh, when I was old, a little older, right before puberty, my mother saw something, and she was very disturbed with some of my behavior. I went into a depression and got very strange. And she didn't put, she didn't get me to a psychiatrist at that time. That was a, you know, a very negative thing to have to go to a psychiatrist. Not anymore, thank God. But um, she said, "I'll just, you know, I'll just make sure that he's, you know, covered." Yeah. And they, my whole extended family, took care of me. And I, I think that's what did it. And then in the past couple of years, we find out that some of the genes that I have, it turns out that they're high risk for psychopathy. But they're also that's if you're brought up in, a, in an abusive. Uh, you know, childhood. Right. But if you have these alleles and you grow up in a positive one, it negates the other effects. So in a, in a way, I'm just mirroring, if you have these genes, I'm mirroring what the environment I was born into was going to be, and which turned out to be quite sweet. So if, if, so you were you were lucky in that sense, but there there might be other people who have your kind of profile who are not as lucky. Or... I, absolutely. And this really... I, I had always really been a proponent of genetics driving all behavior. Right. So when this came up, I had to eat some crow because I said I might be wrong about this. And then we really started look, you know, the whole thing about epigenetics, how environment interacts mm-hmm. with the genetics you have to turn on and off certain genes works. Then it made sense. And, and so I, I, I began to respect the role of early environment on, on who you become. That's for sure. Hmm. This is Ira Flato on Science Friday from NPR. Talking with uh, with uh, James Fallon, author of The Psychopath Inside, A Neuroscientist's Personal Journey into the Dark Side of the Brain. It really, it's really interesting, and you are very honest in this book about your feelings about being, you know, a, a psychopath and, 
and the journey through your life and how you've dealt with it. Uh, you seem to be saying that uh, it, it might just take a shove. Could there be a, people who are psychopaths who are not acting out on their psychopathy, uh, sitting next to you in the park bench just waiting for the right shove? Or I don't mean physically, but that breaking or the snapping point? Yeah, that, Ira, that, that right shove is, is usually a very early stimulus. The closer to the time of birth that it, the abuse occurs or the abandonment, the more profound the epigenetic effect on sort of catalyzing the psychopathy. Uh, so even though I have very strange thoughts, I don't act them out. You know what I mean? I, yeah. uh, and so I think that there are, and I have very, you know, really kind of bizarre dreams and, and thoughts, but I, I think because, look, at, I don't need money. I don't need sex. I don't need power. You know, I don't need those things. And I was thinking, what if I did? Yeah. What if I was broke? What if I was didn't have the love and support of a very large, wonderful family, where would I be? And I really got to wonder what I might have become. Yeah. You have an interesting story about the scan of Eli Roth, who makes those uh, hostile movies. And he it's almost like he has found an outlet for him yeah, it was, being a psychopath. Know, I, was, I was contacted by the Discovery Channel. I didn't know Eli. And he said Eli Roth wanted me to test him genetically with you know, fMRI, brain imaging. Um, and I said, don't tell me anything else. And I said, in fact, I know who Eli Roth is because I saw him in Inglorious Bastards. He was the bear Jew, and I, I thought he was great in it. So uh, I had actually voted for him, you know, for best supporting actor. And that's all I knew. But So when he came in, first of all, we did the scans. I talked to him. And when they came, out, I came back, I, I talked to my colleagues. I said, this guy, I said, this actor, Whenever he sees some emotionally disturbing image, because we tested him with emotionally disturbing images and that, he wants to throw up. And his heart rate goes way up, and he's absolutely terrified, more than the average person. And, and I said, but when he looks at something like a flower, he's like an ecstasy. And I said, it was a very different pattern. And I said, when this is going on, he, he does not, he can't tap into it. There's no self-awareness of it. And the way I inferred this is because of the circuitry that was inferred from his fMRI. I was guessing, right? Mm -hmm. And I got his genetics back and looked at the type of empathy-related genes, alleles he had. And then when he came back for the second taping, I said, here's what I think you are. And he just about, he just turned white, you know, whiter. And he, and he goes, he says, that's exactly what happened. He says, the first movie I saw, the scary movie, was Aliens. He says, I threw up. And whenever I see something uh, unnerving, I get nauseous, my heart raises. And so I said, I, and my guess was that he's self-medicating. So he immerses himself in all this imagery, which terrifies him, which some people do, right? Yeah. They go after the thing that ter terrifies them. They, we do this as kids. And, and by that way, he can control it, because it's his imagery he's creating in these movies. So we got back to my house. He goes, he says, I gotta have a beer. He says, I'm not a drinker, but I gotta have a beer. And so we called his father at my house right after the taping. And, and said, Dad, this guy, he said everything you always said. And it turns out Eli's father is a psych psychoanalyst from Harvard. Oh, so we had a fun time with that. I bet you did. So, anyway, I was able to go through uh, those traits based on his images, brain images, and the genetics. Either one alone, I wouldn't quite have been able to do it. Wow. This is Science Friday from NPR. Talking with James Fallon, author of The Psychopath Inside, A Neuroscientist's Personal Journey into the Dark Side of the Brain. Um, there are Asperger's, uh, people with Asperger's who don't, you know, we don't consider them psychopaths. They have troubles with with empathy. Is there a difference there? Yeah, well, there's a, there's a uh, the empathy circuit uh, connects to other circuits. It connects to the mirror neuron circuit. Now, it appears that in the in people with like with Asperger's, there's a there's a, a, a poor connection between those mirror neuron areas. That is the ability to understand what others are doing, okay, and uh, and, and what the meaning of what they're seeing is. So they have a problem with that. But they in in and it that connection to the empathy related areas like the insula uh, is also because of that faulty. But that doesn't mean they act anything out in violence because yeah. their amygdala, et cetera, the other parts that induce this and control uh, violence is not, they're normal. So, you know, they may not be able to see it or understand it in such a way, but they don't act it out like a psychopath. What, what percentage of the population do you think has psychopathic traits? 
Well, I, full, psych, full psychopathy, it's 1% to 2% in any population. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pan-cultural, so it, it occurs in all cultures. And it's a very it's interesting that, that, you know, our genome and our, that we've kept this so close to us, this, you know, why? Could, could this serve, could, could famous people, you know, leaders, is this is something a positive trait for them to have? If a general, well, you know, if a general is is ordered to go into battle, and you know, and he says, "I got to get the job done, and I can't let my feelings get in the way of it." That's right. If, if you're a, if you're a surgeon, if you're if you're uh, a leader, a president, a CEO, you've got to do brash things. And it turns out that people with psychopathic traits uh, can can are very successful at taking chances. For some somehow they're able to read things without without uh, reference to negative emotion, right? They don't sense negative emotion and you can, or pain that much, really. But people, if you look at it in a more general way, those sorts of traits, bravado and this manipulativeness and, and glib and the willing to take chances, the risks, it's important because most people will not take risks. Most people are safe, so things stay static. And if that's true, you know, how, how does a a company or how does a country or how does a family protect itself because there's always others out there that are predators on your group or your family or you. And so it's important probably to have people with those traits because they have not only the the lack of fear and the willingness to take chances, but, you know, how many people have the energy to do this? How many people have the energy to be a president or a CEO every day to go out and say things that they could get nailed on? So you've got to have you've got to have a healthy dollop of narcissism, and you know to, to yeah. really pull that off. So it's probably important, or else you couldn't do those jobs on a day to day basis anyway. James Fallon, thank you for being with us today. It's a really interesting book, The Psychopath Inside: A Neuroscientist's Personal Journey into the Dark Side of the Brain. And good luck to you. Thank you, Ira. Good talking to you. You too.